Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, let's get started. So welcome to this week's Center of Korean Studies webinar. So my name is Anders Carlson, and I'm the, the chair of the center. And today we are very glad and honored to have with us uh, Professor Adam Bonnet, who is an associate professor in, in history from King's University College at Western University of Canada, which is also in London, but in London, Ontario. Uh, and he's an expert on the foreigners in Korea, so the border region between Korea and China, and the kind of interaction that was going on. As an MA from Kangwon National University in South Korea, and his PhD from the University of Toronto, and got that in, in 2008. And before joining uh, King's University College in 2012, uh, he was uh, at the Research Institute for Korean Studies at, at Korea University. Uh, his talk today is going to be based on his book uh, titled Turning Toward Edification Foreigners in Chosen Korea that was published by the University of Hawaii Press in, in December last year. So it's, it's a very new and, and recent a publication. Uh, so Professor Bonner is going to talk about, as I understand, one aspect of that very interesting book. Uh, he will talk about maybe 40 minutes, and then there will be plenty of times for, for questions and, and comments. Uh, and as always, if I could ask you to put your questions in the Q&A box, uh, please not in the chat box. Uh, so any questions in, in the Q&A box, uh, at any time throughout the talk and then afterwards uh, as well. Uh, and then we will forward your questions to Professor Bonnet. So please, Professor Bonnet, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and happy new year, all of you. Uh, my talk actually has a somewhat newer New Year's theme and that I'm talking about people who uh, don't get along with other family members. So I'm going to uh, share screen. Uh, so where, so my talk indeed is, is based on my book, although I'm starting with an anecdote that isn't uh, directly from my book. Uh, I had to remove it because my book got a little bit too long. Just go to slideshow. Uh, so in 1771, there was a scandalous event in uh, the Oidong in the Chinese community or the Chinatown in Oidong. Uh, basically what happened was is that uh, to describe some of the people involved in this event, a man called Wang Hanjong uh, was a military official with a successful career of office holding and, and who is a member of the Jenam Wang family descent group. Uh, which was a descendant of a of a actually a man who had accompanied So Hyun Seja back to uh, Hansong uh, in the 1640s after the um, chosen submission to the Qing. Uh, so he was uh, someone who had a close association then with uh, Hyo Jong, uh, who was the great Ming loyalist king, as it were, between 1649 and 1659. Uh, Wang Hanjong accused another member of claiming to be of his descent group, a man called Wang Hangil, who had just passed the examinations and had done very well in the examinations. And Wang Hanjong spread a rumor that Wang Hangil had faked his ancestry, that he originally had the surname Kim and uh, had, as it were, illegally associated himself within the Chinese community in Oidong. So the result of this rumor, it reached the ear of the palace and of the King Yongzhou. And Yongzhou brought in Wang Hangir and his, Wang, his father Wang Muksok in for questioning. And the whole event upset Yongzhou a great deal. Uh, as Yongzhou saw this willingness to abandon one's roots for financial gain as resembling hair appear, lice rather, lice appearing uh, within hair. So Yongzhou's concern was tied up with a project that he had been, had been pursuing for a good 20 years. 
Beginning in the 1750s, the chosen court under Yong Zhou began granting special status to a community of descendants of Ming migrants, first in the capital in Hansong or Seoul, and then spreading out toward more distant locations. During the uh, 17th and early 18th centuries, the descendants of Ming migrants had been classed with other foreigners, uh, including Jurchens, Japanese, and Dutch, as uh, submitting foreigners or Xianghuai. So this is the uh, term number four in the list. Uh, this ter term, this category, granted them from protection from most personal attacks, taxes in exchange for a submission of, tri of, of a tribute in fish to the Board of Rights. Uh, and therefore, it described the descendants of all the foreigners, including Chinese, as migrants permanently coming to receive edification from the chosen monarch. After the bureaucratic changes beginning in the 1750s, however, the descendants of Ming migrants, in contrast to others of foreign des uh, descent, were freed from tribute duties, were given preferment in examinations along with the descendants of, of loyal, loyal and good subjects of Korean origin, so just essentially other people who had ancestors who had done something that made them famous and were encouraged to participate in Ming loyalist rituals in the palace at the Debodan or the altar of great gratitude. So for the members who could claim Ming migrant background, this may represented a major transformation and improvement in their social status. So eventually this, this new identity for the descendants of Ming migrants resulted in new terminology. Uh, they, their, their, the terminology through which they were categorized was moved from Xianghuoyim, submitting foreigner, to imperial subject or Huangzhouyim. Uh, and it also changed the way they were under the narrative through which they were brought into the chosen state. So instead of being outsiders who had come to accept new loyalties, they were described as Ming loyalists who had come to Chosen specifically to avoid changing their loyalties, to avoid linking up with the new Qing Empire. Uh, this new identity fit in with what was then a core ideological project for the Chosen Court. Uh, beginning in 1704, the Chosen Court under Suk Chung established the Debodan Shrine, uh, where Chosen monarchs could sacrifice to first the Wanli Emperor, at the very beginning of, of this, this shrine, and then later under Yongzhu and Zhongzhou uh, to the Chongzhen and Hongwu emperors as well. So to the first and last Ming emperors as well. As many scholars have pointed out, but notably Zhong Okja, this process um, uh, arrogated to, chosen, to the chosen monarchy the exclusive inheritance of Ming legitimacy. And of course, most Chosun uh, elites, most Chosun Yangban officials did not accept, at least in domestic discussion, the legitimacy of the Qing Empire, which they considered a barbarian dynasty that imposed itself upon the Ming and had no legitimate right to rule the Ming. So it, in a sense, it was involved a process of raising the status of the Chosun court to the position of exclusive inheritance of the Ming legacy. Uh, and so this new identity for the descendants of Ming migrants therefore brought them into this official narrative, a narrative of the chosen court and also involved transforming their, uh, their, their own histories, their own family histories. Very often when they originally arrived in Chosun, they were from pretty uncertain backgrounds. They were deserters, they were runaways. Uh, they certainly, their life after they arrived in Chosun wasn't particularly prominent. And yet this new status established them, generally granted them uh, elite Ming ancestries. And generally, of course, the initial migrant was described as someone who had not only fled the Qing, but had fled while resisting violently against the Qing coming to Chosun only because there was no more hope. So it involved also a transformation of the status of their migrants and uh, the process of bringing them into official state ideology. So in this book, in my book, I argue that this change tells us a number of things. Notably, it confirms that for the chosen court before the 1750s, subordination to the Ming was not understood sort of in a nationalist sense 
as subordination to Chinese people or to Ming people. And no contradiction was seen between accepting submission, the accepting the submission of Ming people to the chosen court and being subordinate to the Ming in diplomatic relations. Because of course the chosen court in diplomatic relations also acted as a subordinate or a status subordinate uh, in at least its formal diplomatic language. Moreover, when Ming migrants were reclassified as imperial subjects and distinguished from other people of foreign descent, this was after the fall of the Ming, well after the fall of the Ming, at the point when Chosen itself claimed to be the only heir to Ming legitimacy. It thus, represent, re, thus represented less a break with earlier practices as a rephrasing of it, and was part of a general trend, also visible in the Qing, to treat loyalties as absolute and unchanging. Insofar as it involved transforming the ritual lives and family histories of Ming migrant descendants brought into the Chosen Court's ritual project, it may also be seen, or I see it as an example of vernacularization of identity, as described by Victor Lieberman uh, for Southeast Asia, uh, or for early modern Southeast Asia, rather. But what I'd like to emphasize in this paper uh, is well, something that does come up in my book, but I thought I'd put the focus on it a little bit more in this presentation, was how messy the project was and how messy the process was. Uh, that uh, if you read the hagiographies of, young, of, of these Ming migrants, it would seem to be a very simple process. Yongzhou and Zhongzhou as sage kings are recovering sort of persecuted minorities and giving them their proper status as elite Ming officials. Uh, if you go through the documents, however, everything is much messier. That first of all, the original Ming migrants don't seem to have been a particularly elite status. Uh, certainly, when after they arrived in Chosun, they were deeply mixed up with ordinary people or even people of slave background. And really, there, far from being a restoration of status under Yongzhou and Zhongzhou, it was creation of a new intermediate status for the descendants of Ming migrants. Uh, moreover, you can find if you look at the records that the Ming migrant descendants themselves, who are generally non-elite, played a very key role in shaping uh, the status which the chosen court was granting to them, uh, and often shaping the status in ways that the chosen court didn't much like. So I would like to emphasize in this talk sort of the messiness of the process. Uh, so uh, to move down, uh, what well, Xianghuayin status, of course, originates in, well, broadly speaking, it originates in China. Uh, it's also was used or similar statuses can be found for the already in the Three Kingdoms period. Uh, literally, Xianghua or Xianghua in Chinese means turning away or moving, turning to, or moving towards uh, edification or transformation and envisioned people from unstable frontiers traveling to the center uh, to receive the transformation of the monarch. So in the case of Chosun, of course, this is frontier people moving to the Chosun monarch to receive uh, edification and transformation from the Chosun monarch. Uh, in China, certainly it always implied voluntary submission. And of course, this voluntary submission was often entirely uh, uh, you know, propagandistic, uh, that say groups in Southwest China who were forced into submission through violent means would nevertheless be described as voluntarily submitting uh, to the uh, Ming or Qing monarch. Uh, similarly, in, uh, in Korea to, uh, sorry, Similarly, in Korea, for instance, here's a quotation from No Sa Shin in 1497. Uh, in, uh, Since antiquity, emperors and kings did not refuse people who, longing for morality, came to submit to transformation. Uh, however, I've uh, not yet heard of a case of outside people coming to submit in response to one who deliberately sought to obtain their submission. So foreigners who received the status were frequently granted. Uh, so uh, this was the ideological uh, framing, which always was voluntary submission to an edifying monarch. 
uh, the practical reality of submitting foreigner status uh, was that they were granted protection from taxes and military services for a set amount of time, generally in exchange for not engaging in raiding or piracy on Chosun's coasts. They were also, or, and Northern Frontier, they were also granted often land and oxen to engage in farming. Uh, sometimes they were granted wives and Korean names and clan seats. So the, the, the practical matter, practically at least according to the great code of state submission, initially they were supposed to be granted these, pri these uh, privileges only for the first three years after their arrival. Uh, but in practice, it tended to become hereditary. So already in the 15th century, uh, there are references to uh, the chosen court trying to restrict the inheritance of submitting foreigner status only up to grandchildren of the original migrants. Uh, so great grandchildren would thus be removed from submitting, submitting foreigner status and be required to pay taxes uh, like ordinary commoners. Um, the, after the early Joseon, the number of, after the early Joseon, uh, there was a major break uh, or a major change in the number of migrants coming into Joseon during 1592-1598, uh, when of course a major war, when the Japanese, for those of you who don't study Korean history, uh, when the Japanese invaded uh, Korea from the south, uh, and were responded and attracted the response of the Ming Empire, uh, which sent a large army into Korea to respond to the Japanese invasion. Of course, as in any war, people like to stay behind. P soldiers end up staying behind. They generally, when I read the records, it's inspired by having a bad relationship with your superior officer, uh, by falling in love, love seems to have been a major reason for staying behind or just perhaps finding the conditions on your side not to be particularly good and hoping to find an alternative. Uh, and Japanese were certainly, when they deserted from the Japanese armies after an initial year of su suspicion from the chosen court, eventually they were accepted quite enthusiastically by the chosen court because of course they brought in skills uh, that the uh, chosen military didn't have, namely the skill with, especially with firearms, with muskets. Ming deserters were a, a, a bigger issue, a, a, a greater political problem, uh, because of course Ming deserters uh, were, were loyal to chosen's own ally, or were supposedly loyal to chosen's own ally, and were abandoning their loyalties to the Ming. However, they also brought in skills that the chosen court needed. And so generally, uh, seemingly quite a number did establish themselves, even though the Ming at certain point uh, with the support of chosen tried to repatriate all soldiers remaining in, in chosen. Another great entrance of migrants into chosen uh, was during the early 17th century, uh, during the wars of, the, of the, the Ming Manchu wars in Liaodong. Uh, 1618 to 1637, that's pretty approximate dating. Uh, one group of, of Ming migrants who entered during this period, more or less, were Liaodongese refugees. So Liaodongese Chinese from, uh, well, from the, the region of Liaodong on Chosun's northern border, who fled essentially the chaos of, of war between the, the Ming and the Manchu. Uh, some of them became involved with um, military units under Mao Wenlong that were fighting against the Manchu from chosen soil, and quite a number of them ended up staying. Uh, there are also a lot of Jurchen fugitives, and that's complicated by the fact that Jurchen themselves had, in some cases, a pre existing relationship with the chosen state. Uh, but these Jurchen fugitives fled uh, the rise first of Bujantai of the Ula and then Nurhachi, and especially fled assimilation into Bujantai and Nurhachi's um, military, militaries as, as uh, yes. So uh, these migrants, uh, initially at least, uh, 
especially the Jurchens and Jap uh, Jurchens and Liaodongis, uh, were subject to repatriation after 1637. Uh, but after 1644, the Qing no longer tried to forcibly repatriate them. And those, so all who remained in Chosun simply stayed. There, there was no longer any demand that they be returned uh, to the Qing. Uh, so uh, these migrants were administered by the Chosun court exactly like uh, earlier foreigners had been administered by the Chosun court. Uh, communities of migrants formed near coastlines and were uh, where they paid a tribute in, uh, uh, paid a tribute in fish, a boat tax to the Board of Rights. So various attempts were made over time to enroll them in the military, uh, and enroll the, and, or impose other taxes upon them. But these attempts attracted the opposition of the descendants of the migrants themselves, who saw themselves as being on the receiving end of double taxation. And also, of course, of the Board of Rights, since the Board of Rights needed this boat tax, this tax and fish, uh, to they needed the revenues from it to pay its own petty officials, since they didn't have many other sources of revenue. It also troubled people on moral grounds, or at least the attempts to uh, integrate these migrants into ordinary commons, commoner status troubled people on moral grounds. So as one official uh, said, Han Guanghui said in 1754, uh, he described uh, submitting foreigners as divided between Chinese remnant subjects and commoners who wandered in from other regions and said, it is clear that they should not have the same corvée duties imposed upon them as on ordinary subjects. When they first arrived, the Board of Rights provided them with especially generous treatment and worried that they had no livelihood, settling them on the coast and had them fish for a living. Submitting foreigner status alleviated their impoverishment uh, by uh, uh, removing personal service duties. Truly the epitome of, sage, of the sage monarch's desire to comfort people who have come far from far away. So even in 1754, uh, more than a century in some cases since the migrants had come to Chosun, uh, officials could still talk about them as migrants who needed the special care of the Chosun monarch, a uh, special edification of Chosun monarch, and the special protection of the Chosun monarch. Now, that being said, it was a protected status, but as perhaps you can even imagine from the description I've just given, not a particularly prestigious one. Uh, Lots of records suggest they tended to marry women of low status background, of servile background. Uh, they were categorized uh, according, or their, their, their categorization in terms of how they inherited the status wasn't that much different from how slaves inherited their status. Uh, they tended to inherit it on the maternal line, uh, just like slaves. Uh, not only that, the military unit in which many of them were, or the more prominent of them were placed in um, a military unit in the capital, and that was the an ivory troops, the Han ivory troops. Ivory troops tended to be uh, used in order to gather up un otherwise unattached commoners, or rootless people, unattached commoners, and even slaves in other cases. So the very military unit that they were placed in, and this are the most, these are the more prominent ones who are centered in the capital, uh, tended to mark them as being of pretty low social status. So uh, the change, as I mentioned, or a change happened in the 1750s, actually more or less at the time of Han Guanghui's report, uh, when uh, Yongzhou, uh, the monarch then in charge, visited Oidong uh, in the company of other officials and uh, was surprised or, or, or was given an account of the Chinese community there. Uh, one of his officials uh, pointed out that in Yongnam province, uh, Chinese as well as Jurchens and Japanese were categorized uh, on, as submitting foreigners. They were placed into the same category. And this official claimed, rightly or wrongly, that many of them were so upset by this status that they preferred to, to bear the burdens of commoners rather than continue to 
uh, receive this protected status. Yongzhou certainly uh, was very moved by this description. He lamented his own lack of sincerity uh, and reflecting upon the phrase in the Confucian and Analects that there must be a rectification of names, uh, called upon the Board of Rights to investigate who was classified as a submitting foreigner. Uh, as a result of these investigations, he uh, did indeed bring in new policies whereby uh, Jertsons and Japanese would continue to be, or their descendants rather, the descendants of Jertsons and Japanese could continue to be classified as submitting foreigners, while the descendants of Ming migrants would henceforth be categorized as Chinese or Chinese descendants uh, for the, the next two, uh, two items on this list. And they should be continued to be placed under the administration of the Board of Rights, but should be freed from all personal taxes and military service requirements. So they're also therefore freed from the tribute in fish. Uh, indeed, further investigation of prominent Ming migrants descendants uh, uh, discovered that quite a number rec were recorded in the compendium of submitting foreigners. Yongzhou responded by freeing these families from Corvelu labor in perpetuity and demanded that the Hansung administration and the Board of Rights should carefully review the names uh, within the compendium of sub submitting foreigners in order to transfer Chinese descendants into the record of Chinese. Um, so from this point on, officials directed their concern to distinguishing both the designation and tax obligations of Chinese descendants from diverse people who were in position of submitting foreigner status. So during the reigns of Yongzhou and Zhengzhou, the chosen court sought out, using those records that were available, people who could claim a Ming ancestry. Having uh, discovered them, both monarchs actively encouraged their involvement in Ming loyalist rituals in the palace at the Debodan shrine. Under Zhongzhou in particular, the category according to which mar Ming migrants were defined was changed from Huayin, Chinese, uh, to Huangzhuin, uh, which literally, I guess, could be translated as imperial, imperial dynasty person. I translate it as imperial subjects in my book. Uh, the military unit in which the more prominent Ming migrants in Oyedong were placed uh, the Han Ivory Troops uh, was also renamed as the Han Brigades. And from the Han Brigades, a number of Ming migrant descendants were selected to actually be employed as Debudan guards. So to be actually be given a particular uh, institutional role uh, associated with the Ming loyalist shrine, the Debudan altar. So the language used by the Ming migrant, by the chosen migrants was always that of recovery and restoration. Previous courts, as they said, had failed to honor the descendants of Ming migrants, but the 18th century monarchs had finally su successfully restored the people to their proper moral status. So um, there's the, the, the broad outline of, of the development. I thought I would for the, for the last part of my presentation, I will talk about some of the confusions and complications with this moral status, or with this new tax status rather, and how it didn't fit the moral categories and the descent categories that the chosen court tried to place upon them. One of the more interesting cases, and actually quite a significant case for the development of the, of the status was uh, the case of a man called Pak Sung Bok. So this, case is recorded in the Shilok in very simplified terms, but in a lot of detail in the Ilsong Nok, uh, which is, I guess, a Zhengzhou's uh, diary for daily reflection. And uh, Bak Sung Bok was one of a number of appeals to, uh, of appeals uh, by various, various people uh, to Zhengzhou ask, asking their punishments to be canceled or to be, their, to be lightened. <laughs> in almost all the cases, including the case of Pak Sung Bok, Zhengzhou rejected their appeal. However, uh, in some cases, Zhengzhou decided further investigation was nevertheless needed, and this was certainly the case with Pak Sung Bok. So, uh, Pak Sung Bok was um, 
uh, Bax and Bolk had claimed or complained that uh, he, as a, the, the descendants of imperial su submitting foreigners of the imperial dynasty, were not receiving the same good treatment that they had used to receive. Uh, he felt that people of his sort were no longer being cared for in the past. And Zhengzhou therefore ordered an investigation of Chola province of, of irregular taxation and of corvée imposed upon submitting, submitting foreigners and also wanted an investigation of this the confusion of terms, wanted the, the names to be rectified once more uh, to make sure that Ming migrant descendants were not still categorized as submitting foreigners. As Zhengzhou said, these days the teaching of proper social distinction has been declining and those in authority no longer know how to foster the worthy. The damage has reached helpless submitting foreigner villages. How can this not be most disturbing? It is utterly nonsensical to describe the descendants of imperial subjects who fled to our country as submitting foreigners. So in response, an investigation was indeed launched as a result of which the governor of Chola province, Yi Dukshin, uh, em emphatically dismissed all of Bax and Bok's claims. He declared baseless Bax and Bok's claims, uh, accusations of corruption and and irregular taxation. And he also rejected Bax and Bok's claim to imperial subject status. Perhaps not surprising, right? Uh, those of you who know Korean and Chinese know that Bak is not a particularly typical Chinese name. Of course, the, I think it does exist in China as well, but it's more typically a Korean name. And as it happens, it's also the sort of name that was often given to Jurchens upon arriving in Korea. So the name itself tends to suggest he's not of Chinese origin. Uh, moreover, the magistrate in charge found out that his family had originally used an obviously Jurchen clan seat. Uh, and that clan seat was Heilong um, uh, Gang, which is, of course, Heilongjiang uh, in Chinese, the Amur River in, in Russian, and was very often a clan seat that was taken by Jurchens upon arriving in Chosun. His family had, his ancestors had later changed their clan seat to something sounding a little bit better. They had changed it to Dewan, which can be a Chinese clan seat, but actually can also be a clan seat associated with the Yuan dynasty, and therefore was also often accepted by Jurchens upon arriving in Chosun. So it was a somewhat more ambiguous uh, clan seat. Uh, from this, Yi Dukshin was able to assert that it was clear without a doubt that Bak is falsely claiming uh, imperial subject status. His survey of imperial submitting foreigners and imperial subjects in Chola province also did not turn up any serious failure to rectify names or indeed any unjust taxation, at least at the county level. He did suggest that there may be some customary payments demanded on the level of garrison administrations or island administrations. And those, of course, could be quite burdensome, I expect. In some regions, he did identify uh, submitting foreigner villages, uh, but since discovered that those living in them had no knowledge whatsoever about their own ancestry. And elsewhere, he did find that a distinction was made between submitting foreigner villages and imperial subject villages, Although he discovered that in some cases, people who claimed to be imperial subjects, just like Bak Tixin, when you looked at their clan seats, they had clan seats that obviously marked them as Jurchens or Japanese. Uh, so until the, third, until the seven, early 17th century, of course, the chosen court had in fact granted submitting foreigner clan seats and Korean surnames, but this history seems to have been forgotten by the late 18th century, or at least by Yi Xin. From the governor's point of view, the proliferation of the same clan seats among people of different surnames made no sense, suggesting the proliferation of lies. Pax and Bok, the governor concluded, was of the same ilk as other fraudulent imperial subjects. So, uh, so although the decision went strongly against Pax and Bok, whose case became a precedent for rejecting later baseless claims of this source, it also confirmed the term imperial subject or imperial subject descendant as the official designation for those who could establish descent from the Ming. Uh, 
indeed other terms largely disappear from the official record. Even as the supposed descendants of Ming's migrants appealed during the reign of Zhengzhou and Sunzhou, their classification as submitting foreigners, uh, even as they appealed this classification of su submitting foreigners, demanding instead to be referred to as imperial subjects, so the Board of Rights struggled in much the same manner as before to distinguish false claimants to Ming migrant status from legitimate ones. And I actually, it's almost surprising that Bax and Bok's claim was rejected because I have certainly found much, very, very, very spurious claims to Ming migrant status or certainly to distinguished ancestry that nevertheless were accepted by the chosen court. I don't want to go too much over time. I did include some possible cases in my paper and I can return to them or I re can refer to such cases in the question and answer. But I think I'm going to go to the anecdote with which I began the discussion, which as it happens is not in my book. This is a, a, a free anecdote for those who uh, come to the, the SOAS seminar. Uh, so, um, so in the case uh, which I just described at the beginning of this presentation, uh, ultimately I'll move up to the top to where I have that. Uh, this case involved initially at least another accusation of fraudulent assertion of Chinese origins. Uh, this was made by someone of unquestionable Chinese origins, Wang Hanzhong, who it was from a, a, the Jianam Wang family that had been closely associated with Hu Zhong and had therefore enjoyed a certain status and a certain access to official position, especially military positions uh, within the capital. And he had accused Wang Hanukir and Wang Muksok as being of being fraudulent claimants to Chinese status, that they were their original surname was Kim and was later changed to Wang. Uh, so when Yongzhou brought them in for interrogation, uh, Wang Hangir, uh, Yongzhou and his ministers made Wang Hangir's offense clear. You have falsely claimed to be an imperial subject, subject and falsely settled in the most weighty neighborhood. The crime is great indeed. If you confess honestly, then you may be forgiven. But if you do not, you will be punished for claiming a fraudulent surname. What is your original surname and for how many generations have you been claiming the surname Wang? However, Wang Hangil, in common with lots of young people who are uh, participating in the Solal festivals right now, uh, was entirely uninterested in genealogy and had no idea about his ancestry. Uh, he said, I am too young to know my family history and only heard about my ancestry from the Office of Military Positions. I, father, was therefore interrogated since they had ho hoped that the father might know a little more about it. But his father Wang Muksak claimed that until his son had passed the exam, he had not known about this change in surname at all. But after his son's exam success, uh, dis uh, a distant relative, uh, Wang Su Han, had informed him that his ancestor was in fact a Korean named King who had been adopted by a member of the Jin of Wang. It was at this point that the tables turned very strongly against the accusers. Uh, so Yongzhou also interrogated Wang Hanzhong, asked her how he had known about the surname of Wang Muksok, only to be, receive vague answers and the advice to ask this same sixth degree relative of Wang Muksok called Wang Suhan. And it turned out that Wang Suhan was suspiciously easy to find. He was waiting outside the palace, hoping to be called. And this made Young Zhou suspect that a plot was afoot. So he was already angered by the heartlessness of Wang Suhan in selling out a relative and by Wang Hanzhong's vague answers to this question. And so, uh, so he, uh, and additionally, uh, so he eventually uncovered uh, that this had actually been a setup. Wang Hanzhong had managed to get Wang Suhan uh, to, to confirm this rumor, rumor, rumor and to make this report, likely in order to push out a rival that Wang, Wang Hanzhong was annoyed that Wang Hangir, someone he considered considerably below him in status, 
was trying to, as it were, enter into his turf and was annoyed by that. And so was trying to prevent him from participating in the same lofty status that he himself enjoyed. This, of course, was very annoying to Yongzhou, who, among other things, had, on account of Wang Hanzhong's Ming migrant status, had forgiven him for a case of corruption when he had been magistrate of Pyonghe. So uh, uh, Wang Zuhan, when Wang Zuhan tried to deny that he had been in on the plot at all, he tried to escape this accusation by playing dumb. Uh, saying that he didn't even know the location of the Office of Military Positions, uh, but this routine uh, did not convince Yongzhou at all. Uh, so in the end, Yongzhou restored Wang Hangil and Wang Mukstok to their status, but punished Wang Hanzhong and Wang Suhan with exile and with enrollment for the military tax. Furthermore, a proper investigation revealed that Wang Muksok's ancestors were indeed recorded in the household registry as Chinese fishermen, a detail which strongly suggested genuine Ming refugee origins. So this brief scandal in the Chinese village in Oidong uh, illuminates the changing understanding of Ming migrant descendants in chosen society. Imperial subject status had become valuable enough under Yongzhou to attract jealousy and the desire to restrict access to membership. The early submitting foreigner villages had hardly been homogenous, well-placed locations, and had certainly involved considerable intermarriage. Yongzhou recognized this had been true of the Chinese as well, noting that when they first came to Chosen, they had all intermarried into Chosen Yangban families. Um, more broadly, though, after all these generations, Yongzhou still saw the community as Chinese, and in fact, initially, had unsuccessfully sought to police and maintain their Chinese identity. He had instructed another prominent Ming migrant descendant in Oidong to prevent further marriage between imperial subjects and Koreans, and to force those who had been intermarried out of the Chinese village, although very soon, he recognized that this was an impractical suggestion and aband abandoned it. He upbraided Wang Hanzhong for attacking a fellow imperial subject from Shandong, even though they were not actually related to each other, and accused him ultimately of being the sort of person for whom the phrase, when there, are, when there is hair, there must be lice. Uh, he was that, the sort of person for whom that phrase was intended to uh, to, to describe. Uh, in, the, in the end, Yongzhou nevertheless wanted a clear distinction to be made, although such a clear distinction was impossible. As he said to Wang Teung, is Wang Muksok, Wang Muksok an imperial subject or is he a chosen person? Clearly assuming that he must be one or the other. So, what does this messy process, or, or what do I think is interesting about this messy process? Well, imperial subject status was connected to the Ming loyalist project ultimately. And Ming loyalist ritualism was obviously a court dominated process or a court driven process, at least in part. However, in order to uncover imperial subject, the course, chosen court had to remake people who had not been uh, particularly prominent in status upon their arrival, had not lived in well-organized villages and not lived according to well-structured patrilines. I think it's very likely, in fact, it seems pretty certain that Pax and Bok believed what he was saying when he was an imperial, when he said he was an, of imperial subject origin, when he said he was of Chinese origin, because likely in these villages, people didn't distinguish very, very clearly. Their tax status as imperial subject status was what united them. And attempts to distinguish this would probably have been forgotten after so many generations had passed. Um, Wang Hangil, for that matter, hadn't been very clear about his own origins, nor had Wang Muk Sok. I think it's also perfectly possible that they had ancestors, their ancestor was an adoptee, although this may not have appeared very clearly in the records. Um, perhaps I feel like defending Wang Hanzhong to a certain extent. So ultimately, as I argue in my book, although um, the 
Ming Loyalist project was driven in part by the court. Uh, it was substantially shaped by, by ordinary uh, people and by people of relatively low status who also tried to manipulate uh, the new language of Ming Loyalism for their own benefit or indeed internalize this new language of Ming, Ming Loyalism into their own identities. Uh, so thank you very much. I will uh, stop share and, and bring the talk to an end. Sorry, yes, here I am. Thank you so much. This is a very a fascinating talk. Uh, a lot of interesting detail in it. And this is, this is an area where I think there isn't that much written in, in English about it. Um, and you, you really drawn out, you really shown how much fascinating material there, there is in the, uh, in the sources. And you can really get into stories about people and, and stories about these families. Uh, and and I, I find that extremely fascinating, kind of micro historical approach to it. Uh, I do see that we have questions coming in. Uh, I, I thought I start with, with a few questions and then as the questions come in later on we can turn to them. Um, as, as the, the chair I'll just start things off. Um, I was interested by the fact that they, they were paying tribute, fish tribute, and then the, the quote you had by Han Guang He, then he said that they, they had them fish for a living. Yeah. So, so that was the policy that they were going to be fishermen. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess it might be because they didn't have any land to give them or they didn't want to take land for someone and to give it to them. But it, it does seem to contradict some of the kind of concerns that they had about the kind of coastal security and I, I mean uh, what I remember in the beginning of the Chosen dynasty I mean they, they tried to keep Chiang Hui under some kind of surveillance and, and were quite cautious about them going to the coastal areas uh, etc so I mean did they discuss that as a, a potential issue to have all of the well, all of them I don't know how many there were but in in the coastal areas that was one thing that I was wondering about and then in, in terms of this change from Hyanghua into Hwangju in, did it actually translate into any change in kind of social economic position or, or anything? Or, or was it just from the state's point of view that they could now say, look, we are looking after these uh, Ming loyalists or did it actually translate for them to some kind of benefit? Which is simply indicate that you said they were actually trying to get it. Well, that just financial things that they were, were looking after. So that, that would be my my two questions. Okay, so I will. Um, so for the first one, that's in, an interesting uh, subject. I I would like to look into some more aspects of this for the 17th century. The the more aspects of the boat tax. Um, of course, after sort of uh, mid Songjong, uh, mid Sukjong rather, uh, the the, the chosen court started to more actively uh, settle uh, the island's communities. But of course, before that, indeed, that that's, was a genuine concern. Uh, there was a case uh, in the early 17th century uh, where a concern was raised at how good the Jurchen boats had become. Now, it, now, of course, worth mentioning that it was in the seven, early 17th century, it was generally Jurchens who were sent to fishing communities on the coast. I, I definitely think Japanese would not have been allowed that far south in the coast. Japanese would have been treated a bit differently. Uh, the Jurchens were in, uh, had, were becoming so good at fishing and had such a large fleet that the concern was raised that they might ally with the Japanese to attack Kanghua Island if there was another invasion. Uh, but officials dismissed that. They thought there wasn't, there was really no such worry um, I expect it was substantially led by the lack of land, uh, although there were cases. I, I tried to not to get into too many qualifications in my actual talk. Uh, they were, they could be, there were land bound submitting foreigners who are then to pay a tribute in uh, cloth, although the boat tax seems to come up more often in the records. 
um, as for the, the change in social status, um, I think it, it's in actual, so I mean, they didn't actually gain Yangban status, all, not for the most part, although they, they could claim some of the, of the, uh, the bells and whistles, I guess, of Yangban status, nevertheless. Uh, but they were, had one tribute duty removed from them, which is probably pretty significant. Uh, they were brought into the company of the chosen court during Debodan, Debodan rituals, so they were actually brought into formal court rituals in company with high officials and in company with the monarch. Uh, they certainly gained greater access to uh, military positionists. Mostly they, were, they participated in the military bureaucracy. So I think it was probably pretty significant. Uh, and uh, the very fact that they are given someone improved status, I expect improved their ability to resist extra legal uh, taxation, which of course is always always a problem on the village level, uh, on the local level. So, okay, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I, I realized I should have reminded you after the talk as well. So, if, if you please could put your questions in the Q and A box, it's easier for me to keep track. I, I think there are two questions in the chat box, and I will of course forward those as well. But but. Please, if you can put them in the, the Q&A box. And the, the first question we have it is from Vladimir Glom. Mm -hmm. uh, and he asked how the Chosen court could manage to keep the Ming communities, the Tebodan, et cetera, out of sight of, of Qing envoys. Uh, were they always bribed, as is often stated? And were there any Qing reactions to this? I think by 1704, uh, Han Myung-ki actually makes, makes, found an interesting quotation in the Qing. I think this is actually even with the Kangxi Emperor, uh, which by the Kangxi Emperor, after the end of the revolt of the three feudatories, the Qing really didn't care very much. In fact, uh, if you, the, they liked it. They liked being able, and, and here I, um, I refer, I, I don't know why, I've been mentioning too many Wang, so I've suddenly forget, forgotten his given name, but a book recently came out in Cornell University Press by another man surnamed Wang, and I do know his name. I, it's just flown out of my head briefly, so I apologize. Uh, he, he points out that in fact, for the Qing, uh, the fact that the Ming, that the Chosun was as it were the ideal uh, tributary of the Ming or the model tributary of the Ming as the Ming itself described it, was helpful for the Qing for asserting its own legitimacy and for asserting its own right to demand, demand subordination from other people. So by 1704, if the Qing, I don't think it was, they would, the Suk Chong pretended he was trying to keep it secret, but by 1704, it didn't matter. The Qing really didn't care uh, if the Chosun was, was engaging in Ming loyalist rituals, as long as it wasn't too uh, too noisy about it. Uh, of course, since there was no no one they could ally with at this point in order to attack the Ming, uh, attack the Qing rather. Uh, now, of course, the rituals themselves were right in the middle of the palace, so uh, they were probably relatively inaccessible uh, to Qing envoys. That was, I'm guessing, another issue. Okay, thank you. Uh the next question is from, <clears throat> sorry, Owen Miller. And he asked if you could say anything about what happened to these communities of foreigners in the, in the 19th century. Well, that's the, the 19th century. That's really a Wang, uh, Wang um, Hansen Yun's, I have Wang's on my brain, uh, Hansen Yun's topic. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, the 19th century, of course, uh, the, the early 19th century, which is as far as I really trace them, although I, I, I do see, look at them a little bit up to the 1990s, uh, the early 19th century saw them especially establishing their own publication projects. So uh, writing their own biographies uh, in order to assert their, assert their own dissent group and strengthen their connection to Ming loyalism. Uh, establishing their own shrines in many cases, although some of them had had shrines established before, but establishing their own shrines outside of the capital where they continued to try and maintain their uh, Ming loyalist status, despite what often seemed to be declining interest from the chosen court. So 
Sun Yun Han has a really good article in Acta Koreana where he discusses that, uh, but certainly there is a bit of a shift. As for the late 19th century into the 20th century, uh, of course, they continued to assert this status up to the 1990s. Probably some continue to assert this status today, uh, including continuing to use the Ming loyalist ca calendar, at least in publications I've seen up to the 1990s. Uh, some of them, the ones who are associated with Zhou Zhongam, uh, claimed an association with the Weijong Choksa crowd and then also with the um, with anti-Japanese activism. I haven't, uh, with the Yibyong, uh, I haven't been able to look into those claims in any great detail, but certainly they continue to exist as a, a separate status uh, with a certain amount of prominence. They produced a lot of their own genealogies. They produced their own publications, their own collected works. Uh, which they maintained into the Japanese colonial period. Okay, thank you. Uh, and there's a question from Ian Jeffrey. Uh, so I'm interested in Ming migrants and loyalists living in Korea after 1644. And then were Han Chinese more favorably, by, favorably treated by the Chosen court at that time? Um, no, no, uh, Han Chinese didn't really get favorable treatment until after 1750. Uh, there were a minority of Han Chinese migrants before 1750 uh, that for whatever reason, because of their close association with the uh, with Hyozhong, uh, had relatively good treatment. Uh, but that was of course also true of, as, as some will know of the uh, Sayaga Kim Chun-sun, a, a Japanese defector whose uh, whose descendants were given relatively good treatment, partly because of Kim Chung-sun's exemplary service for the chosen court. Uh, but generally, the Ming migrants, Han Chinese origin people were simply in, in village, submitting foreigner villages and received the same treatment as Jurchens and Japanese. They, they didn't receive notably better treatment. They, they may have, in some cases, uh, they may have, uh, at least immediately after the Imjin War, just thinking a, a little bit differently. Some of them were able to sell their ability as geomancers or medical experts. And I suppose that sort of skill might have given them some technical skills which would have helped them in local society. But even those who were based in the capital in Seoul had to pay the fish tax. Even the, the members of the Han Ivory troops, they had to pay fish tax, but they went into the Han River to catch their fish. So they caught fish in the Han River and later accounts describe this very romantically. That this was, you know, the typical, you know, the story of the of, of the high official fishing for fish without without a string, as uh, because there's no uh, no hope for for hope in a world where the barbarous Qing has taken over the Ming. But at the time, yeah, that was just a fish tax. They were being treated just as if they were jurchens in that sense. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, the next question is from, from Sang Piljin. Okay. Uh, so could you comment on the different treatments accorded to the Huangzhou in depending on their status and lineage in Ming China, if that actually, if that existed? So I understand, for instance, that Qin Jin's grandson moved to Korea in the 17th century. Uh, I would also appreciate if you could comment on the treatment received uh, by Sayaga, Kim chung Son, and how his experience could be compared to Huang Qianghua in Huang Zhou In. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Jin In's grandsons. I have not looked uh, a, a lot into uh, Jin In's grandson itself. A lot of these lineages are pretty uncertain. Um, uh, some of them are incredibly weak. Uh, to give some examples, um, uh, one descent group which is actually described by Zhong Zhou as having unusually good uh, sources for it. Uh, their proof of connection uh, to the Ming was identified by discovering uh, documents hidden in a well. So they placed letters from the emperor in a well 
uh, presumably, and this was their evidence of having prominent status in the Ming, or evidence the, the descendants used for proving their prominent status to the Ming. Uh, there are a few cases that are a little bit better. Uh, there is one descendant of Li Lu Mei, who I think probably is genuinely a descendant of Li Lu Mei because he arrived when people who would remember Li Lu Mei were still around. Uh, but I, in, in most cases, you have to uh, carefully distinguish whether they actually had those lineages or actually had those statuses or not. And I think in many cases, the answer is no. Uh, that their, their actual connection to Ming China is pretty weak and, uh, or their connection to Ming China may be genuine, but their connection to elite people with the Ming is pretty weak and cannot be proven uh, with any certainty. That uh, another example is a descendant of Ma Gui uh, ended up in Chosun and he appears actually in a relatively early record by Kim Yuk, uh, but in his case again, uh, there would have been no really very secure evidence connecting him to, uh, to, to his famous ancestor. As for Sayaka Kim Chu's Chung Son, that's a very interesting, uh, interesting example because in contrast to other Japanese, Kim Chung Son's and his descendants actually had very prominent lineages. And actually another distinction between Kim Chung Son and uh, most Ming migrants is that he was pretty well recorded. Uh, most Ming migrants there, you have a real gap in the records between the 17th century, when we have just scattered records, and the 18th century, when suddenly we get much more elaborate biographies and much more elaborate, elaborate genealogies. Uh, with Sayaga Kim Jung Sun, of course, that after his arrival in Chosun, he remained in, um, uh, he, he remained more, he and his descendants remained more or less in the same place. Uh, throughout the 17th century and continued to have a relationship with the chosen court during this time when their ancestry was pretty well known. Now, I do know that Kim Chung, some of Kim Chung Sun's writings, uh, some scholars have suggested uh, that they are not completely credible, uh, that many of them might have been later uh, well, forgeries or perhaps not even deliberately seen as forgeries produced uh, during the 18th century. Uh, nevertheless, his situation certainly in a sense is an example of how prominent you could become in the 17th century uh, uh, through, through another route. But of course, he didn't, get, uh, he didn't get imperial subject status. So he didn't enjoy that switch in status. But initially, his family and people around him would have been given very similar, similar would have been placed in a very similar category, I expect. I, I stumbled a bit with that answer, I apologize. Thank you. Uh, next is a question from, from Chan He Li. So thank you for your great presentation. So despite Chosun's, Chosun Court's efforts, so I have a feeling that Pang Juin were not well accepted into Chosun society. The Pak Sung Bok, like your example. And I can think of another Huang Juin, Kang Se Jat, who did not integrate into the Chosun society. And then what do you think is the reason for that? That they were not accepted, that they didn't really integrate into Chosen society despite these policies? So I, I, I love Kang se -jak. Thank you for mentioning him. He's my favorite. Uh, and um, I think actually they did integrate into Chosen society. They just didn't integrate into the more prominent levels of society. And I say Kang Zijak actually did integrate pretty well. Uh, he was, his family, uh, I mean, after all, who was Kang Zijak? He was a migrant from outside of the boundaries of Chosun, who ended up on the very outer edge of the Chosun state in Hamgyong province. And yet not only did he integrate, he was able to have conversations with Pak Sedang and Nam Guman, which was far higher status than most people in this initially uh, illegal settlement in Musan, uh, uh, upstream from Hueryong, certainly was much more than his neighbors could enjoy. Uh, however, ultimately, I think when we, people talk about them not integrating, uh, the issue is, is I think they were accepted into chosen society, but they were not 
really acceptable within Yangban society. And uh, Kang Zhejiak, after all, he married upon arriving in northern Hamgyong province, uh, a, a post station slave. Uh, now, I, so that's integrated in its own way. He's, he's married a local woman. He's uh, apparently on good terms with his neighbors. But certainly that was initially a challenge for his descendants, who are therefore not really, uh, who, because they have slave ancestry, are ineligible for taking official position. Although, of course, because of Kang Sejak's connection to initially to Pak Sedang and Nam Guman, two prominent officials, he was able to uh, restore his status, right? Um, he was able to, uh, uh, or not restore his status, his descendants were able actually to gain pretty significant status. They were freed from slave status and allowed to participate in uh, administration. In now, as for uh, Pak Sin Bok, uh, I don't know about the level of integration, uh, but Pak Sin Bok was, you know, uh, within a society that was filled with status distinctions. Uh, Pak Sin Bok was from another group of people with status distinctions, and this was submitting foreigners. I think in just about all respects, Pak Sin Bok would have been Korean speaking. Uh, many of his ancestors would have been Korean, and he would have interacted with his Korean neighbors quite or ordinarily. So I, I actually, I, I don't agree that they didn't really integrate into Korean society, but uh, that's, that, I guess that's my answer then. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. So, uh, how was the Fan Ching Fu Ming slogan understood by the Joseon court after the Manchu conquest of China? I haven't seen that, that, that statement in, in the records. I'm sure it may, may exist somewhere, but uh, after the Manchu conquest of China, very simply, uh, the Joseon court uh, between 1644 and 1683, uh, uh, the chosen court, as for instance, Ho has discussed, described, a record, engaged in some probably pretty ineffectual plotting against the Qing, military preparation against the Qing. And certainly uh, after the Manchu conquest of China, uh, the chosen court did not accept uh, the Qing and did not accept the, the Qing's right to rule China, although formally in their diplomatic missions to the Qing, they of course acted exactly as they had towards the Ming. Uh, in fact, the Qing in many ways was much better and much more regular in its interaction with the Chosun court after uh, the fall of the Uh, after their uh, after after the uh, after the the, the Ming Qing transition, after 1683, however, and especially after 1704, uh, the the shift was that the chosen court uh, at that point no longer could really imagine uh, launching uh, uh, an invasion of 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 the Qing under any circumstances, and started to reor rethink its Ming loyalism internally. So at least domestically, it tended to, at least before the 19th century, uh, to deny the legitimacy of the Qing and to accept its own exclusive inheritance of the Ming. So hope that that gives you the, that particular phrase though, I don't, don't recall seeing in chosen records. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, Chan He Lee has uh, another question. Okay. Uh, and this relates to sources, source materials. So uh, do you find any difference in sources between Xiang Hua In and Huang Jun after the 17th century? For example, the number of sources, the tone of the description, et cetera, in, in the sources? Well, that, that, that's excellent. Uh, yeah, obviously this, this, I mean, before the 17th century, our sources, uh, before the 18th century, our sources are pretty limited. Uh, the person you so nicely mentioned, my, my favorite Kang Sejak is an exception, that he gets a huge number of biographies because of his encounter with high officials already in the late 17th century. But for the most part, uh, both Yang Wain and Huang Zhuin uh, in the 17th century have pretty limited sources. Um, 
I think actually probably to be fair, not to overstress my point, I think it's probably more likely, slightly more likely for people of Chinese origin uh, to get uh, their names included in records more than people of Jurchen or Japanese origin. Although they also, Jurchens and Japanese also have their records included in sort of uh, bureaucratic documents like the Jungek Sayugi or the Sunjungwon Yugi in the 17th century. Starting in the late 17th century, but especially during by the late 18th century, of course, people of Ming migrant origin get a huge number of biographies produced about them as the chosen court actively tried to uncover information about them. So you see a real increase, uh, especially in the 18th century, but already starting in the late 17th century in the amount of records we have for people of Chinese origin. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is from John Lee. So hi, Adam. Thank you for your excellent talk. Uh, I remember reading in your earlier work that patrolines in Jeju with presumably Mongol origins took on more conventional household seats during the 18th century. I am wondering if this trend ties into the wider trends with Ming migrants you describe, or if the shift in Jeju is more tied to changing chores and policies towards its peripheries, or perhaps these two courses are, are not mutually exclusive. Yeah, I, that, that's a great question, John. Of course, that's um, so. I mean, I, I would like to look more into Jeju, which is uh, another very interesting subject. But I, I think the, these two trends are connected. Uh, that a uh, 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 generally a, a part of what you would describe, I guess, as the growth of the brokered state. Uh, the growth of new, new new forms of relationship between the center and and the areas and the periphery or the areas under the chosen state's control, and therefore also a tendency to spread. Uh, following Lieberman, uh, the the vernacularization of of elite culture and of and of capital culture and the capital identities towards the periphery. So I, I think yeah, those two trends are connected. I don't know that it's particularly related with Ming migrants. I think it's probably more to do with just changing chosen policies towards its peripheries and also an increasing interest uh, in peripheral people in participating in the um, cultural norms of, of the capital. If that, I don't know if that, that makes sense. But. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is a very interesting uh, parallel features. So that was the, the, the last question in the Q&A box. Uh, if anyone else has any question, any comments, please uh, add those. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, so I'll, I'll announce the next webinar seminar that we're going to have. Uh, so we'll have a short break now. We've had three uh, in a row. So the next one will be on the 19th of March. And then it's Professor J.P. Park for, from Oxford University, and then that is going to be art history. And, and the title of that talk is Rescuing Art History from the Nation, Late Chosen Korea Between Europe and Edo, Japan. Uh, looking forward to that talk as well. Uh, I think that might have been the last question, Adam. Okay. So thank you so much for a, a fascinating talk. Uh, thank everyone for participating and for your questions or maybe no sorry uh, there are more questions okay so excellent uh, there's another question from sang piljin uh, so was there any special military unit staffed by hangwe just like those staffed by former ming subjects Question. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Indeed, there were, and especially Kim Chung Sun and his descendants were associated with a special military unit. Um, I have forgot the name of this unit, but it's somewhere in the back of my head. Uh, so, a really good article, and trying to remember her name, a really good art, uh, article in, uh, oh well. Anyway, I don't remember the name of the author or the article, but there's a really good article which I read, uh, which describes the, the 
Hangwe community near, near Tegu. And generally, uh, what's interesting about her description, because this all actually appears in a household registry, is that the Hangwe who lived within the, the, the village itself uh, tended not to be listed as Hangwe in part because uh, I, I think it's fair to say the military unit with which they were associated clearly established their identity. So in fact, everyone within this, um, within this Hangwe community were one way or another part of or organized into this military unit. And I am sorry, I've forgotten the name of the military unit, but that was true of Hangwe as well, indeed. Okay. Especially Thank those you. associated with Kim Chung Sun. Thank you. And uh, finally, it was, was, was not a question, it, it's a comment by Valentina Tusa. Uh, so related to my question uh, about the fishing, uh, maybe by seeing the foreigner as brought as a wave, maybe? I think that's a, a, a Korean wave reference. <laughs> I'm not maybe. Quite, don't quite brought as a wave, yeah. Sure. Sure, I, I think it was probably though, uh, probably more, uh, as you said, uh, the need to, in the case of Jurchens especially, the desire to move them, if they've moved south, to desire them to move them away from the border region and mm. to find employment for them, which wouldn't, as it were, take up land, which was already needed by other people. So I guess that was probably more the reason. Well, maybe they were also very good fishermen. I don't know. Maybe they're very good at it. That's also yeah. possible. They certainly, yeah. they, apparently they did very well. That's why the Chosen Court got so worried at one point. They had, mm -hmm. in a very brief time, vastly expanded the number of boats under their control and were really prospering in the early 17th century. So maybe that was another worry. Yeah. Okay. And Valentina, I just said thank you, uh, and that's the end. So yeah, once again, thank you, Adam. Thank everybody for participating for all of your questions. Thank Adam for engaging so well with all of these questions. Uh, it was very illuminating and interesting. I noticed one sentence in Chani Lee's question, uh, which I forgot to answer. May I ask, just quickly mention within five sentences my response to that? Of course, of yeah, course. Yeah, because I, I, I Chani, uh, may feel that I have been um, un, 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 unresponsive. Uh, so I, obviously the tone of, it, of the description also changes hugely in the 18th century, in part as the biographies f produced during the 18th century become much more hagiographic. So uh, you notice, for instance, back to your friend Kang Sejak, um, our, our mutual friend Kang Sejak, I guess, we, we have a mutual friendship there. Uh, Kang Sejak's uh, early biographies tend to describe him in a manner that really is very much less, much livelier, uh, much less exclusively Ming loyalist, I would say, from later descriptions that often had to edit aspects of the original description. So for instance, as you may know, Pak Sedang is descri describes Kang Sejak's um, drinking habits, his tendency to throw leaves into creeks in order to destroy his rival fishermen's nets and things like that. And so Pak Sejang tends to describe Kang Sejak almost in a comic manner, in a very different manner from the way Ming loyalist migrants were described in late 18th century courts, where they're all absolute paragons, you know. Uh, the, the, you know, a Qing, Qing officials come with swords to chop off their heads and they refuse to submit saying, I only have one life to live, but but uh, so I only need only die once. So why should I submit to betray the one true dynasty? And then the Qing officials, of course, are frightened by this incredible expression of loyalty. Well, uh, the earlier, the, the few biographical texts we have for the late 17th century are certainly a, a, a lot livelier and a, and a lot less worthy than that. Anyway, sorry, I just thought I'd answer my, I missed that sentence in Chani Lee's question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think that was a good end to the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, once again, thank you, Adam. Thank you, everybody, for, for participating today. And I hope to see you on the 19th of March for Professor J.P. Park's talk as well. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.